So, um, I said last year, uh, last week, last year, it feels like last year. Um, last week, I said that the, the title of what we're going to do uh, as we go into 2020 was, we're going to title the message, New Year, New You. Every time we, we get to the end of the year, there's always a message we want to talk about where you forget the past, you look forward, but you know what, as we go into this new year, yes, we are you know, supposed to forget the past and move forward, but how about focus on becoming a new you? And I will explain what I mean by that, because I don't mean new like, oh, all new, no. It's really more the word renew. It's, it's time for us to be renewed and um, become what the Bible has called us to become. Every single one of us have, called, have been called to be something for the Lord, right? Uh, we're all called to minister for the Lord, one way or another. And, you know, every time I pray, I think many of you hear it, but I always pray even for the birthdays now, so I say, Lord, I pray that you, you know, help, you know, whatever, whoever be the person you've created them to be. We're all created to be someone that the Lord has designed for us to be, right? And everywhere you look in the Bible, not everybody was Moses. Not everybody was Joshua. Not everybody was Elijah. But, you know what? There are people in the Bible who we look at as being not important, but they have a great um, part. Look at someone like Rahab, right? She has a very small part, if you think about it, in the book of Joshua. But you know what? From her line came the Messiah, and all she really did was protect a couple of spies. Everybody has a part to play in the church, in the body of Christ. But I was thinking, I'm like, man, it's 2020 already. A lot of the youngsters maybe were not alive. Some of you were. But, I mean, if you remember 2000, that was the Y2K thing. And you know, everybody was nervous about Y2K. The computers are going to crash when the numbers change. Nothing happened. They had uh, every technology department of a, of, a, of a company was working around the clock around New Year to make sure that the computer systems didn't break down. But it yeah, looked Y2K, 2000 came and went. 2010 came and went. And here we are going into 2020. And as the new year approaches, a lot of people, what they'll do is, you know what they're going to say, I'm going to begin, now, all of us have what we, make, what we call a resolution, right? We say, I'm going to do this in the new year. I am not going to do this anymore in the new year. And basically what a resolution is, is a promise of change. And um, hope that this year they do it. So I looked up what are the top 10 resolutions that people often make on a yearly basis. Okay? Number one is exercise more. And you know what's funny? You know how like, most churches technically are full around like Easter and Christmas? Gyms are full in January and February. And then they get empty. <laughs> so, exercise more is on the top of the list. Number two is lose weight, because obviously they go together, right? Number three is get organized. Number four is learn a new skill or hobby. Number five is live life to the fullest. Number six is save money and spend less money. Well, guess what? If you spend less money, you would save more money. I mean, that's just simple mathematics. Number seven is quit smoking. Number eight is spend more time with family and friends. Number nine is travel more. And number ten is read more. That's the top ten. There's other things, get out of debt, eat healthier, learn something new, uh, be less stressed, uh, you know, things like that. That's just, it's really not a resolution if you think about it. But what's scary is when you do the math, only 46% of people actually keep them keep their resolution. Less than that. Okay? Now look, these are all good things. This list is not a bad thing. It's, it's actually, it's, it is a good thing to take inventory of yourself and say, okay, I've had this year, next year I want to change in this area. Now I'm talking right now just everybody, but here's my encouragement to you this year is, what about spiritually? Do we take inventory spiritually? and say, you know what, I need to become spiritually renewed. Right? Because 
The world is suffering, as we see. The church is suffering, they're under attack. And I'm going to be honest with you, weak, lukewarm, loveless, compromising Christians are not going to cut it or impact the world anymore. Because what's, what's scary is that the world is beginning to see through the fake Christians. You guys realize that, right? So for me, I think, you know, is it great pressure? It is great pressure on us. Because we're supposed to watch how we act. Watch what we say. Watch what we post. Watch what we fill in the blank. And I understand many of us have different, you know, times of disappointment that we've had this year. Times of great satisfaction too. Um, but I will caution you this. This is not about that. Many, a lot of people do spend time, too much time, focusing on the past to the point where they can't see what's right in front of them. We spend too much time on regrets and what is. Um, how do you have a quote written down? I saw it one time. I don't know who wrote it, but I thought it was awesome. And this is what it says. It says, the best way to destroy today is to regret yesterday and to worry about tomorrow. Oh. What? You want to hear it again? The best way to destroy today is to regret yesterday and worry about tomorrow. We spend too much time thinking about the past and the regrets, and we spend too much time worrying about the future. And we miss the day. Listen, does it mean that we're never to think about uh, yesterday? No, we should. Yesterday is used as life lessons. They're supposed to be used to teach us, to help us, to um, be memories, but not defining moments of who we are. Because look, every Christian, if they were to live in the past, we'd be miserable because who we were is where God saved us from. Now, I said before that there's a bunch of resolutions, and they're good, but now let me give you some Christian resolutions, right? Let me ask you some questions. Or you ask yourself, or do you ask yourself these questions? Or do you say, wait, you know what? How much time did I spend with in God's Word? You say 2019. And then you can add, was it more or less than 2018? I'm Again, this is not to condemn or put anybody down. This is inventory you should take on yourself. It's good to do this. And I'll explain later on as we get into the word that even people like King David did it. How about how consist was how consistent was I in my prayer or in my prayer life? How much did I pray? How often did I pray? Or did my witness help bring anybody to Jesus? Or did my giving reflect my heart for God? And it's not just about money, it's time, it's effort, it's energy, it's, it's your love, it's your grace. And then my, the question that I loved the most was, have I grown in my Christian walk? Mm -hmm. I will tell you one thing. If there is an area, if there is a time in your life that you were closer to Jesus than you are today, that's a problem. I'll tell you why. It's like me being a 42-year-old man go back to doing what I was doing at six. It's something's wrong. Imagine I just go sit in my mom's lap and say, Mom, can you feed me? Something's off. As a Christian, there should be growth. Every single day. Now look, all of us have had ups and downs, but this is not a time to sit and beat yourself up because that's what Satan wants. That's not what this is about. It's a time to get up, dust yourself off. Okay, I had a bad year. We're just going to move forward now. Because that's what God wants. So I'm going to read where we're going to start off is in the book of Isaiah, chapter 43. And then we're going to... Um, Launch off from here, three points, and then and then be on our merry way. Isaiah chapter 43, 15 to 19. Obviously, God is speaking to the children of Israel, but it, it but it but it relates to us today too. Now look, when I was reading this 
first verse, I'm like, we can close the Bible, close the Bible study, and go home. Because honestly, I am the Lord, your Holy One, Israel's Creator and King. That's enough for us, by the way. It's, that's more than enough for us. When God says, I am the Lord, I am the Holy One. End of story. Mm -hmm. Now, verse 16. I am the Lord who opened a way through the waters, making a dry path through the sea. Now listen. Okay, you guys should know this. This is basically the story of the children of Israel. Listen to this. But look, put it up in your life too. I am the Lord who opened a way through the waters, making a dry path through the sea. Meaning, God is saying, I am the Lord who's done miracles in your life. Who's done the impossible. And all of us can say it. Now he goes on. I call, call, call forth the mighty army of Egypt with all his chariots and horses. I drew them beneath the waves, and they drowned their lives, snuffed out by the smoldering candle, candle wave. Translation, I took the enemy that was attacking you, and I destroyed him. You see what I'm saying here? And then he goes, but forget all that. It's nothing compared to what I'm going to do. You see, a lot of us are stuck between verses 15 through 17. The reason why the children of Israel all died in the wilderness is because they refused to trust the Lord for what was coming. They refused to take that step of faith into the Jordan River, into the new things that God wanted to do in their lives. They kept focusing on, well, now look, for I am about to do something new. See, I am already forgot. Do you not see it? Everyone's like, I don't know. Am I supposed to see it? It's time for us as believers to open our eyes to what God is doing. And I don't mean our physical eyes. We have to get out of this physical mentality. It's time for the church to open their spiritual eyes. Because God does a lot spiritually, but we don't see it because we refuse to look at it from a spiritual standpoint. You have to understand, you are spiritual beings. All of us. Why? Because the physical will die one day, but the spirit will live on. That means that when I look at life, I have to look at it from a spiritual standpoint. Now, how many of you want uh, God to do a new thing in your life? All of us want it. Yeah, I do. But I think all, all of us as Christians, we need to desire to change from a spiritual standpoint, though. We all say, I want a new thing, but it all has to do with physical things, earthly things. How about spiritually? Do you want God to do something new? Do you want God to say, hey, step out onto the water, but there's waves. Step out onto the water because that's where I am. You want something new? Step out onto the water. You know, I was, uh, when we were down in, in Florida in, in, in the summer, there was some stuff going on, and I was thinking, do I do it, do I not do it, do I do it, do I do it? And I sat there in Calvary Chapel in Fort Lauderdale, and the pastor comes out and goes, Christian, you have to take a risk! I thought he was yelling at me. Sometimes you have to take a spiritual risk. We are afraid as Christians sometimes. I don't know why. God is on... But well, look, when we're on God's <coughs> side, God is for us, right? It doesn't mean we're not going to go through difficult times, but it does mean that we're not alone in the difficult times. And I want to share a couple of areas that we should focus that will change us. And, and again, like I said, when I say new, I mean not new like I'm a new person, because technically we as Christians have all become new, old is past. We've become new. I'm talking about renewed. Renewed. Like, brought back to life almost. It's because all of us can look at the past year and say, you know what? I think one of the resolutions could be, I think the resolution of get organized is, is almost like saying, I need to get myself together, man. And we don't say that. We don't say that. But you know what I'm really saying is, you know what, I need to redo some things in my life. I need to set priorities. I mean, we had, uh, us and I had dinner with uh, uh, a brother uh, a while back, I forgot, maybe a few months ago, 
And he said, you know what? My greatest prayer for the church today is the priorities of the church have changed. It's no longer about Jesus. It's no longer about, you know, the family of God. It's all about earthly things. Priorities need to change for the church. We need to get out of the, what I call the Christian comfort zone. Christians have a comfort zone too, by the way. Right? They only do so much. Okay, I'm not doing that. Go talk to that person. I don't want What if they reject me? Get out of the comfort zone. It's okay. Be rejected. Even Jesus was rejected. But I want to share a verse because even Jesus said in Luke 5, 37 to 38, and no one puts new wine into old wine skins, or else the new wine will burst the wine skin and be spilled, and the wine skins will be ruined. But new wine must be put into new wine skins, and both are preserved. Translation, Jesus said, if you want to do some new things in your life, and you want to have a, 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 if you want God to do new things, some of the old things have to go away. Some of the old ways have to stop. Actually, how about this? All the old ways have to stop or go away. We have the desire to have to do it. And um, the first way to do it to a, a new year, new you, very, look, this is going to be a very practical message. It's going to be encouragement. It's going to be an, uh, what the Bible calls an exhortation, meaning like I'm pleading with the church, let's do this as a church. You do it as a Christian. I will do it. Obviously, I have to do it for myself too. I'm not exempt. I'm not excluded from this. God actually puts a greater uh, responsibility for me to do it first. But the first thing we need to do for a new year and a new you is we have the desire to have a like a new mind, a renewed mind. The Bible says in Romans chapter twelve, verse two, as we know this verse: Do not conform to the pattern of this world. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then, by the way, listen. You struggle with making decisions? You struggle with being able to separate what is from God and what is from the world? The Bible says that you have to renew your mind because then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. When I struggle in my life and I can't make a decision, that means that something is, my mind is not being renewed. Everything starts and ends in the mind. Everything. In uh, Ocean Grove, when you go into the, uh, the gym area, there's this a quote on top that everybody knows, but it was said by a man, I forgot his name, but I copied it. It says, so a thought, and you reap an action. You sow an action, you reap a habit. You sow a habit, you reap a character. You sow a character, you reap a destiny. But notice where it all started. A thought. Paul said here that when we're, we're to renew our minds so that we can test and approve what is of God, meaning that the renewing of our minds helps us to know what is truth, what is not. Mm -hmm. What is of God and what is not. Now there's a commentator that said that the word transformed, I think we talked about this and I've said it before, is the word metamorphosis of a butterfly. You ever see, well, I've never seen it, but a caterpillar goes up on a tree, kind of hangs out, and he begins to change. The cocoon is built, and inside the caterpillar is becoming a butterfly. But here's what I want to tell you. The change in the end is something completely different than what it was before. Meaning, our transformation of our mind should be different. Our thinking needs to be different than it was before. That's what Paul is saying. I can't think like the world and honestly follow Jesus with all my heart. I can't. It's impossible. Our minds need to change in 2020. We're, and, and, and look, we're citizens of heaven. Do we agree? Yeah, right? That means our thinking must reflect our citizenship, not our culture. Amen. Just because state law, just because the government says it's okay, it doesn't mean God's law says it's okay. Amen. Look, it doesn't 
doesn't mean that we can't love somebody. It doesn't mean that we can't, you know, have a, 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 a what's the word I'm looking for? Look, I'm not saying we should argue or be difficult. Never do that. What I'm saying is let your mindset stay true to the word of truth. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 2 says, set your minds on things above. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 23, the New Living Translation says, from a wise mind comes wise speech. The words of the wise are persuasive. Remember, our thoughts will always determine our actions. Our thoughts will always often determine how you speak, how you re react. So what do I do with my thoughts? What do I do? What do you do with your thoughts? Because that should be the question. Okay, I want to renew my mind. What do I do when those thoughts come, John? Look. There's no magic recipe. But there's what God's Word says. God's Word says that for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strong, strongholds. Casting down, now look, follow along. Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. So basically, he's saying that all our, 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 our battles, all our enemy tactics have nothing to do with the physical. Meaning, you have a person that's driving you insane at work, or in your family, it doesn't matter. It has nothing to do with them. It has to do with the enemy that is behind them. We sometimes pray the wrong prayers. We have to pray, according to the Bible, against the enemy behind. Because there's only one enemy of your soul, and that's Satan. It's not, you know, your husband or your wife or your whatever, your boss or your, you know, great uncle. It's not. I know we want to say that, I know we want to think it, but it's not. And then it says, casting down arguments and every high thing. Now obviously, that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. This is what Paul is saying here. All the enemy wants to do is put thoughts in your mind that are going to pull you away from knowing God more. That exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And Paul is saying that when those thoughts come, you have to be brought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. And that's something that a long time ago I heard a message on and it stuck to me. And basically it's this. Every time a thought comes, now granted it happens, it's a split second in your head. Every time a thought comes, it's like, Lord, is this from you? No? Okay. Move it away. Get it out. Get it out. Is it from you? Okay, then you process the thought. Remember, when you begin to, when thoughts come into your mind and you dwell on them, you know what happens? They go from mind, listen, they go from mind to heart, from heart to hands and feet, and to the mouth, everything. So if you have an angry thought towards someone, if you don't remove that, or if you don't take it to Jesus and have him remove it, guess what happens the next time that person says to you, hey, could you help me? No, I'm not going to help you. It's the truth, though. <laughs> we have to learn to remove it. The worst thing you and I can ever do is think for yourself. We have to start allowing Jesus to be the leader of our thoughts. You have to fill your mind with Jesus and His Word. You know what? Some people say, you know, you Christians are brainwashed. Yeah, we are. We have to be brainwashed. I wish I could wash my brain more and more with God's Word. Because it's only that way I can actually do something in the world. I can't do anything else on the One quote I read said this. Let the mind of the master be the master of the mind. And I believe that that person got from this verse. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Jesus. My mind has to reflect my Savior. My mind has to reflect my leader. The reason why the moon can shine is because it reflects from the sun. Without the sun, the moon is dark. Let me tell you something. If you start thinking like the world, 
your mind's going to become like the world. When you start to think like Jesus, your mind will become like your actions will become like Jesus too. That's the first thing. You want to, first step, it's a three step program. No. Here's the first step to becoming a new, improved Christian, renewed, spiritual man and woman is a new mind. A new mind like Jesus. The next one is a new heart. But the church today universally needs a heart, heart transplant. So many think that they have the heart of Jesus, yet we don't. And look, just like, just like the uh, follow, um, think for yourself, what's worse than think for yourself is follow your heart. Because um, the heart is not trustworthy. It's not. And let me share what the Bible says about the heart of man. Jeremiah, this is a well-known verse, Jeremiah 17. The heart is the most deceitful thing there is in desperately wicked. Very simply put by the Lord, by the way. No one can really know how bad it is. It's an it's a easier translation. Only the Lord, Lord knows. He searches all hearts and examines deepest motives so he can give to each person his right reward according to his deeds, how he has lived. The Bible calls the heart wicked. Now, we hear this all the time. Oh, he has such a kind heart. I mean, what you're really trying to say is he's a nice person. That's what you're trying to say. We don't really know the person's heart. Someone can be kind, but you don't know their heart. You give someone five seconds, they can turn it instant. You know when you know a real person? is when you turn the heat up a little bit in their life. When it gets a little bit difficult, you back them into a corner, then what happens? The real person comes out. Here's another verse. This is after the flood. God, you know, destroyed the earth. Noah and his family comes out. And what does Noah do? He wants to worship the Lord in thanksgiving. He, he, you know, um, he has a sacrifice. And the Bible says that the Lord smelled the smooth, soothing aroma, meaning the sacrifice pleased him. And then the Lord said in his heart, by the way, God said it within himself. He said, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake. Although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, nor will I again destroy every living thing as I have done. We parents know this, right? We don't teach our kids to lie. They learn to lie on their own. We don't tell kids, mine, mine. Selfish. From the age of like one. So look, you're saying, okay, John, what are you trying to prove? I'm not trying to prove anything. All I'm saying is, don't trust your heart. Trust the Lord who knows our hearts. Look, even King David. King David was known as a man after God's own heart. Meaning, all David wanted to do was get to know God and how God's heart was. And even David in the Bible, and then look, do you realize, and this is the difference, imagine God wrote a book about me, and I knew it. John is a man after God's own heart. You couldn't get near me. Don't come near me. I'm a man after God's own heart. I know all things. I'll answer everything. What is it that you want? I'll say. David, on the other hand, David's like, Lord, you have to search my heart and see if there's any wickedness in me. I know what you said about me, but I don't know myself. Even David knew that he needed a heart exam from God daily. Now, my question to you is, are you asking the Lord to search your heart daily? Well, sometimes I forget. It's okay. Start the minute. I just won $50. I don't know who that was. <laughs> are we asking God to search our hearts daily? And let me ask you another question. Do you have any bitterness in your heart towards anyone? How about unforgiveness, anger? Do you know that's where you store that stuff? The Bible says in Hebrews chapter uh, 12 or 13 that, that if you don't remove that stuff when it comes, the thought comes, the, the action happens, that, that creates a root in your heart and that bitterness builds and builds and builds. And guess what it reaps? It reaps, reaps an ugly plant and thorns begin to come out. And then you begin to have bitterness and anger and envy and, and everything towards everybody. Why? Because you didn't take care. 
care of it from the beginning. You allow it to embed in the heart. That's why it's important to say, Lord, search my heart. Why? Because I believe that God will say, John, that needs to go. Why are you still angry at this person? But Lord, John, I don't want to hear it. Why are you so angry at this person? I'm not angry at you for all the sins you committed. Am I? No. But Lord, you're supposed to. And then Jesus will say, hey, you're supposed to also. See, we kind of, I don't know what it is that Christian. We, we almost feel like we're entitled to do something when we're not. It's like we're allowed to not forgive, yet we command people to forgive us. We're allowed to be angry at people, but God forbid someone is angry at us. We flip out. Christian, be careful. Jesus says that stuff, be careful. You want forgiveness? Jesus said you better be the first one to forgive. Better be the first one. But why do I say this? Because look, I care about us. I care about you. It's, it's a recipe for disaster. Nothing good comes from that stuff. Nothing. Think about it. What good has come from anger? What good has come from bitterness? What good has come from envy? I mean, Cain was jealous of his brother Abel. What good came from that? Murder came from that. You know what I'm saying? This, the Lord desires to give you a new heart. It's, very, it's a very simple prayer. Lord, search my heart, please. Something's wrong. Every time this person walks in, why am I looking at them weird? I don't remember. And then God will slowly begin to peel back the onion. And then the stink comes out. You know, you, know, you hold an onion up, there's nothing wrong with it until you begin to peel the, the peel and it stinks. That's what God wants to do with our hearts. He wants to peel back the onion. Yes, look, that's between you and the Lord. No one needs to smell your stink. Seriously, no one needs to smell the onion. You can smell it with God. And then what's the beauty about God is He takes that and in Ezekiel chapter 36, 26, He says, I'm going to give you a new heart. I'm going to put my spirit in you. I will take out that stubborn heart and give you a tender, responsive heart. And I'm going to put my spirit in you so that you will follow my decrees and be careful to obey my regulations. You know what God is saying? God is saying, when you come to me and say, Lord, search my heart. Okay, John, here's the thing. You see that? That's got to go. But look, that's got to go. Okay. He takes it out, and then you say, okay, Lord, you have to replace it with mercy and grace and love for this person now. And God, and that's what he begins. Whoop. Now all of a sudden this person walks in and you're like, this is really weird. I love this guy. That's God doing the new heart transplant. We as Christians have to walk around with new hearts, new minds. It's extremely important. And the last point to a new year <clears throat> dot, 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 new you. I know it kind of sounds like a gimmick. I should write a book, New Year, New You. There's probably a book out there. <laughs> There's got to be. Nobody search on Amazon right now. You can search for it. And if there isn't, let me know. We'll write a book together. No, I'm kidding. But then the last one is new love. And it's going to sound weird. But we need to change the way you love. The church is missing love. We love who we want to love, we don't love who we don't want to love. The problem with that is that it's completely opposite to what God says. We're supposed to love everybody. I didn't say you have to fellowship with everybody. I didn't say you have to trust everybody. I didn't say you have to be buddy-buddy with everybody or accept everybody or what they do. But it is our command to love them like Jesus did. Now, I did a search in the, uh, you know, if you guys ever use Bible Gateway, if you type in the word, top, the word, so I typed it under the New King James, the word love, and it appears 504 times in the Bible. The word love appears 504 times, right? The first, does anyone know the first time the word love is used in the Bible? First time. Yes. No, it is in Genesis, but where in Genesis? Chapter 3. No? <laughs> Wait, you guys. 
All right, I'll give, you, I'll, I'll give you a hint. It was a father and a son going up on a mountain in uh, chapter 22. Verse 22 is when God said, take down your son, your only son whom you love. First time the word love was used in the Bible was in Genesis chapter 22. Now, in the Old Testament, the word love, the word love is used 267 times. In the New Testament, it's used 237 times. Okay? The book of Psalms has the word love the most, but obviously it's the longest book. It's 150 chapters. It uses the word love 47 times. Now, in the New Testament, the word love is used, like I said, 237 times, but out of the 237 times, the book of John, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, 73 times. Well, that's why John is known as the disciple of love, right? Church history has it that towards the end of his life, he's 90 years old, they go and they, they bring him to preach on a, on a Sabbath, they prop him up, he just would say, children, love one another, and that would be his sermon. And you'd be like, John, can you do that? That'd be great. <laughs> but you know what? If we did that, we would be different. Now obviously the Bible has a lot to say about love. Why do you say? Well, because for God so loved the world. That he gave his one and only son. The message of the Bible is love. God loved the sinner so much that he sent his only son to die on the cross. Now I said new love. Yeah. Because Christians have forgotten what it means to love. What it means to love God first, above all, and then love each other, second. Now, you do be led, it's going to get really difficult when you have children. Okay? Because the, the biggest trouble when you have kids is, do I love my spouse for more or my child more? You would like, John, it's like sacrilegious to love my husband more now. The baby's a month old. The greatest thing you can do for your child is love your spouse first. And then love your child. Love God first, obviously. <laughs> but what happens when kids come along is all of a sudden the kid, kid jumps up to God level and then the spouse is second or third or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but the reason why I think we've lost the meaning of love and loving God first is Honestly, look, we, we live in a selfie world. We live in a self-focused world where we miss it. We, we, we miss what's passing by us. Yesterday we were in the car. Was it yesterday or Friday? Nikki, I don't know. I'm not going to ask you to correct me. But um, we were driving somewhere and the Holy Spirit gave me something. We were talking about looking into the mirror, you know, and like checking yourself out. I said, you know what? I said, we have to be careful. I said, if we spend all our time looking ourselves in the mirror, we miss all those around us. Mm -hmm. Technically, all you see is people behind you. We've forgotten what it means to worship the Lord with love. We're, by the way, I think the church is afraid to worship the Lord with all their heart. I really do. You go to a Pentecostal church, people are crazy. These people are crazy. But you know what? They're, they're worshiping God and they don't care what they think. And it's not just Pentecostals, there's a lot of other churches there. But we forgot what it means to love Jesus. What loving our fellow man means. You know, if I were to ask someone, what does it mean to love somebody? Well, how would you love somebody as Jesus commanded? Well, you know, but you know what? Sometimes loving somebody is going to tell them the truth. Maybe loving somebody is saying, you know what, come here. You're a Christian. You shouldn't act that way. You know better. I love you and you're going down a path of destruction. People won't love that way. Because they think that's not love. That's wrong. You know what the worst thing you can do is not tell someone they're going down a path of destruction. Then they get there and then you say, well, you know, I saw it all along. They'll say, well, why didn't you tell me? Love sometimes tells the difficult news. But love also sometimes, when a person falls, repeatedly picks them up. It doesn't step on them further. Listen, again, love doesn't mean we accept everything. Some things are just not okay, according to the Word of God. 
but it doesn't mean we stop loving Him. We love, but we never move away from what the Bible says. Every, in, the, in, the, in the Bible, everybody tried to trip Jesus up. Trip Jesus up. You saw it. People would come and they ask him questions and they're like, well, it's almost like they got it. It's like you see football players get into a huddle. It's almost like the religious, you know, I don't know, nitwits of the day got together and said, okay, what can we do? Right, one, three, one, two, three, what? Then they would come, Jesus, we have a question. It's almost like they want to trip him up. And, and in, in Matthew chapter 22, it, talk, it says it in Luke and in Mark, but it says, which is the greatest commandment? Because look, this is a trap question, by the way. It's a trap question. It's like asking a parent, which child do you love more? It's a trap question. Because all of them are like, which one do you love more? Dad? Now every parent will say, I love them all equally. Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's the safe answer, by the way. That's the right answer. Well, you can't say, well, I love your sister more because, well, well she's a successful one. Look at you, just go home and you're 30. <laughs> I'm kidding. You can't say that. It's a trap question. This is a trap question. Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, according to Deuteronomy chapter 6. And then he says, and this, so Jesus is like, wait, that's, that is the greatest commandment. But here's what's second. You shall love your neighbor as yourself, which by the way, is in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 19. Jesus said, on these two, the commandments hang all the law. On these two commandments hang all the law. You know what Jesus is saying? Hey, Genesis to the Lord, now it's done. It's still good. Love God, love people. That's what it says. What are you talking about? That's what it says. You do those two, you'll be able to obey God's word. It's the lack of love that, that causes us to do things. It's the lack of love that causes us not to go out and witness to the person that we know needs to hear about Jesus. What do you mean, John? I love them. No, no, no. I'm talking about God's love where you step out of the comfort zone. And the modern translation of this is like if someone came to me and said, Hey, John, can you sum up the Bible in a couple sentences? What would it be? Love God, love people. Love God, love people. If Christians would just love God as the Bible commands, with all our hearts, minds, and strength, we would automatically become new creations. Now, I said to myself, okay, wait a minute. You ask yourself why Christians struggle with love sometimes, right? And I think I know why. Because this is where I struggle. Until I got it. I have difficulty accepting the fact that God loved me. Remember the woman that was um, basically wiping Jesus' feet with her tears and stuff? Simon, the, the Pharisee, basically said, and he said it to himself, if you remember. He basically said, if this guy was actually a man of God, he would know what manner of woman is touching him. To imply that she was not a good woman. She had a side job, basically. You know what Jesus said to him? He was forgiven much, loves much. Meaning, in essence, what Jesus is saying is, the person that understands that God loves them, often loves God more. The more you know your love, the more you will love. And the greatest lie that the enemy will often tell is God doesn't love you. You're not worthy of God's love. Or you're all alone. God is not with you. Look at your sins. That's a lie. If that's the case, Christian, none of us are worthy to go to heaven, including Paul himself, because he said, I am the greatest of all, of all sins. God does love you. God does love me. Not because of me. Because of him. Because he is love. First John chapter 4, we're almost done. Beloved, let us, this is a song we used to sing in youth group. Be loving, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. 
Now, we used to sing with the King James. <laughs> he, who, oh wait, who, he who loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. God is love. Oh, so many of you remember this. Beloved, let us love one another. First John 4, 7 and 8. Very easy way to remember these verses. Sing them. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. In, in this is love, not that we loved Him, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. The love of God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. You know what John goes on to say later on? If you can't love your brother who you can see, how can you love a God who you can see? If my brother is created in the image of God, I'm supposed to love him as if he were like God, right? How can I love him, a physical being I can't see in front of me, yet I, I pretend to love this invisible God? I can't. Now, John is so practical and simple, you would think a fisherman wrote it. He wasn't a fisherman, by the way. He made, light, he made the words very easy. But I will tell you one thing, and I, I have to say this, because it's important. Jesus was, John was obviously touched by Jesus' love and, and all that he taught. Now look, John needed to change too because John wasn't always this way. John was not always this way. If you guys remember, in the, and I'll summarize this in Luke chapter 9, they go into the, the village of Samaria, they're preaching the gospel, and they come out, and John and James are huffing and puffing, they're angry, they say, you know what, Jesus, these people are not accepting our message, shall we call fire from heaven? Giant John, who wrote the word love in his books 73 times, said, shall we, basically he said, should we kill them all? Why? Because they're not receiving the word, God. You know what Jesus told them? It's right there. You do not know what manner of spirit you are of. You have no idea what's going on inside you right now. This is the enemy working in your heart. I think, personally, John saw in Jesus' love, even for those that rejected, that it changed his whole life radically. That's why, in the end, at the cross, there was only one disciple there. One. John. Why? Because he understood the love that Jesus had for him. And he was going to even die for the one that loved him. But everyone else ran away. He was the one that was sitting right there. Listen, when we love like Jesus, we can change. We become like Him. We're not ashamed. We're not afraid. We're not ashamed to go to that person and say, hey, do you need help? I'll help you. Yeah, I know it's a little late and I'm going to get an hour less sleep, but I will help you. Why? Because that's what Jesus would do. We wear these bracelets, WWJD, yet we curse somebody out. That's what Jesus would do. Now, you ask yourself, how can I learn to love? Right? It's a good question, because we all want to learn to love the right way. Right? You have to learn. And look, it is, you have to read the love letter. You have to read God's Word, because in it is love. In it, you will learn. In it, you will see Jesus' mannerisms. In it, you will see how He acted around the, the outcast, the sinner, the leper, the, the hated. Then when things happen, we can say, you know what, I'm going to do this because this is what Jesus will do. So in 2020, that's what we need to do. We need to make a decision to become new. New mind, listen, new mind is something you have to do. The Bible says you must renew your mind. You, me. New heart, that's something God does. A new love is, I think, the result of it. That's what we need to do. But before we even do that, you have to make sure that you're His. This is the last verse. If anyone is in Christ, He's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. My challenge to you, Christian, this year, is you want to be a new or renewed you, you've got to be willing to make a change. You have to almost be sick and tired of where you've been. 
I, how many of you have said, how many, and I, I, I'm going to then ask everybody to stand because I'm going to go into this new year um, kind of with a bang. But um, how many of you have ever said, pray, Lord, I hate this sin. Why can't I get rid of this sin? I hate it, I hate it, I hate it. Okay. How many of you change your prayer? And I'll tell you why. Because I used to pray that all the time. I realized nothing happened. I kept doing it. Do you know what I started to pray? I said, Lord, I realized I love this sin more than you. You gotta change me. And this, and look, I challenge God. Lord, you gotta make yourself so attractive that I don't even want to go near that thing anymore. So we have to be willing to ch not challenge God, but you know what? Take God at his word. And say, Lord, listen, Lord, I'm stubborn. <laughs> you got to make yourself so attractive that all I want is you. And God will do it. I pray for God to encourage you. I pray, Lord, I need your encouragement today. I'm a little down and out of it. And God somehow encourages me. It could be a text. It could be a message, a, a verse I remember, a song I hear, something somebody says. It's almost like God saying, John, I got you. Christian, let's go into this new year with friend. Okay? Let's go into it different. Let's impact the world in a different way, in a new way, without fear. And say, hey guys, you want to come to church? Or, hey, you got a problem? Let's pray. Right now, right here. We're in the street, man. No, let's pray. Let's not going to pray for an hour. Let's pray for a second. All right? So that's my challenge. So let's stand up. I want us all to stand. I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray over you guys. I'm going to pray for the new year, for the church, and everything as we get into it. And then this is what we're going to do, right? I want you guys all, as you leave here today, to challenge yourself and take inventory of your own heart and say, Lord, what needs to be changed in my life? Or better yet, say, Lord, new mind, new heart, new love. Okay. Help me. Because I can't do it on my own. Okay? Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for this church, Lord. Thank you that, Lord, your grace and your mercy sustained us and kept us, Lord. Your protection kept us in 2019. Lord, we had our ups, we had our downs, we had our disappointments, we had our satisfactions, we had our joys, we had our pains. Lord, we lost people, we gained people, Lord. Father, I just thank you, Lord. I thank you for this church, for those that come here and worship you, Lord. Those that are not here and worship you, Lord, we thank you. Father, I just pray in Jesus' name, Lord, that this word today that we heard, Father, may it be embossed in our hearts so deep, Lord, that we can't help to desire to want to do it, Lord, and to change, Lord. Lord, the greatest encouragement we have is sort of if you want to become a new me or a new us, we know that we're not by ourselves, Lord, that you will help us every single step of the way. Lord, even our stumbles please you as long as our goal is to march forward towards knowing you more, towards bringing you glory, Jesus. So, Father, I pray over this church, Lord, those that are here, Father, I pray their families, their homes, Father, everything. We lay it at your feet, Lord. Lord, may this year be a year and your favor is upon us more than any year, Lord. Father, give us success, but success from the eyes of heaven, Father. Not how the world sees success, but Lord, how you would see success, Lord. And help us to be satisfied. Lord, give us a heart that is content with the worldly things, but Lord, never content with knowing you. Give us a greater hunger for you, Lord. Help this church, Lord, to make an impact, to be a light, not only in Hackensack, but our surroundings and where we live, at our works, at our schools, Lord. Father, I pray that, Lord, your word empowers and encourages everyone here, Lord. I pray for healing for those that need it, Lord. Lord, I pray for marriages that are suffering. 
financial issues, Lord. Father, I pray for your miracle, Lord. Lord, we said in Isaiah 43, you parted the waters and you crushed the enemy, Lord. But Lord, wait, you're going to do more. So Lord, we're trusting your word that you're going to do more, Lord. Do more, Lord. And not only do more, but get your glory along the way, Father. Father, we praise you and honor you, Jesus. And we pray that you go before us now as we go into this rest of this day and this week and this new year, Father. Make us different, Lord. Make us different. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise